Town Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Tony let out a moan as he rolled over onto his back and felt the cold concrete grip him through his layers of shirts. He put his palms over his eyes while he tried to gather himself. His group of friends had decided this would be the best place to hide from everyone while they drank the bottle of Jack Daniels they scored from his friend Justin's older cousin. It wasn't too hard to get into the shutdown orphanage. It had only been closed for a few years now, but it was almost like the town had completely forgotten it. Most people were too frightened to even approach the looming building. Tony and four of his friends arrived a little after sundown and were able to get into the building with little issue. They set up a small radio in the former lobby of the place, and Tony passed around some of his father's Playboy magazines that he was able to sneak out of the house. The boys had only drank once before, and that was a six-pack that they had shared. The Jack Daniels wasn't something they were ready for. They each took turns taking swigs and trying to show they were tougher than the last by trying not to gag. When the other three decided to stop, Tony kept going. Now he was laying on this cold floor with a massive headache trying to remember what happened before he passed out. While pondering, he noticed it getting significantly colder around him. Wondering if one of his friends was there and opened a door, he took his hands off his eyes to see what was going on. Tony let out another groan and opened his eyes. Suddenly, a little girl was looking down at him. The girl's skin was pale and her lips were blue but she just stared at him, not blinking, with a smile that shook Tony to his core. He scurried to his feet and ran the first direction his body was facing. The door he reached was barred. He tried to push it open with his shoulder, but it was no use. Thinking quickly, he knew he was gonna have to go back from the way that they came. He turned around, but the girl was gone. Was he still drunk? Was this all in his head? As he pondered this, he heard a giggle come from a few feet away from him. He slowly looked over, and there was the girl again, looking up at him, smiling, giggling. Tony ran towards the open door leading outside. Right as he was at the opening, the door slammed. I'm Rob Coakley, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Marquette, Michigan. Marquette is towards the northern part of Michigan, and it sits next to Lake Superior. French missionaries were in the area in the 17th century, but it didn't become a village until 1849, and then it was named New Worcester. A year later, it would officially be incorporated into a town and be renamed Marquette, in honor of Jacques Marquette, a French Jesuit missionary who had explored the region. The primary industry in the area was iron mining, and it would become one of the leading shipping areas in the country. Later, in the 1800s, it would also become a summer vacation haven to many. The Marquette Harbor Lighthouse was established in 1853 on the edge of Lake Superior. A few short years later, in 1861, Nelson Truckee would become the keeper of the lighthouse. He wouldn't last long, as he would go off to fight in the Civil War and leave his wife Anastasia behind with their four children to care for it. It's said that she did a remarkable job during the years he was gone, passing every inspection immaculately. When her husband returned in 1865, he was a wounded and broken man that couldn't fulfill the duties required to care for the lighthouse. Those in charge would not let the family stay and have Anastasia care for it, as they deemed this to be a man's job. So the family was forced to move and find other ways to make ends meet. Shortly after their exit, the lighthouse would have to be rebuilt as the weather conditions had deteriorated the entire building in less than 20 years. Despite the new building not being the one Anastasia managed, her spirit's presence has been seen and felt within. A woman in dated clothing carrying on tasks within the lighthouse has been seen by multiple people throughout the years. It is believed that this is Anastasia. Others have seen her standing by the light overlooking the ocean. 
doors opening and closing on their own, objects moving about, and even singing are other hauntings that have been witnessed within the lighthouse. But there's more than just Anastasia lingering. The only known death within the lighthouse is that of Adam B. Sales, at just the age of 47. It has been said that he is also roaming the halls and rooms of the lighthouse. A keeper of the lighthouse brought in a paranormal team, as well as a medium, after the hauntings intensified, and they were able to confirm these previous two spirits. The following two were also verified by the medium. A boy by the name of David still plays within the lighthouse. At only two years of age, he drowned within view of the structure, and it's believed that he attached himself to the building in the afterlife. When asked, on occasion, David has moved toy trucks across the floors of the lighthouse. The most famous spirit within the building, though, is that of a girl that many have began to call Jessie. Although the exact history of Jessie isn't known for sure, it is believed that she was the child of one of the light keepers in the early 1900s, who fell off the rocks near the lighthouse and was badly injured. A little girl has been seen staring off into the ocean on sunny days, and it's said that she never appears during bad weather. She is also known to especially show herself to women and children, and it is believed that she is the one singing throughout the lighthouse. The Landmark Inn opened its doors in 1930 under the name the Northland Hotel and soon became a hotspot for the town. As well as events and restaurants, many famous people of the time stayed in the hotel when visiting or performing in the area. Amelia Earhart, Abbott and Costello, Duke Ellington, and Louis Armstrong all stayed at the hotel at some point during their careers. It's believed during the construction of the hotel, ladies of the night would come by and set up dates for later in the evening with the construction workers. One of these workers became infatuated with one of the girls and would try to make her his wife. After spurning his advances, she continued to proposition the other workers. The love-struck worker would become furious. He would go on to kill the woman and bury her body in the unfinished basement. Since then, it is believed the woman is responsible for all types of hauntings throughout the building. Staff members and construction workers entering the basement have heard a woman weeping. Voices have also been heard, and the feeling of an unnatural or strange presence has also been reported. A woman is also believed to have died of a broken heart after her fiancé died at sea in the infamous lilac room on the sixth floor of the hotel. Disembodied voices have been heard from within the room. When guests go to investigate, they can't find the source. A woman's apparition has also been seen walking around the sixth floor before vanishing into a wall. One of the stranger occurrences is the phones. Workers at the front desk will receive calls from vacant rooms on the sixth floor. When they pick up, all they hear is the sound of breathing before the phone hangs up. When staff goes to check on the room that the call came from, it remains untouched. The Holy Family Orphanage opened its doors in 1915. Almost immediately, the place would begin having nefarious dealings. It was originally constructed with the intent to only house white children. However, the first 60 kids to enter the facility were of Native American descent. These kids were ripped away from their families with the plan for them to be adopted into white families and never inform them of their heritage. Many of the children wouldn't find out until much later in life the circumstances behind their adoptions. The conditions for those that lived there in the early days started off rocky almost immediately as well. On top of overcrowding, the conditions for the children were not considered great by any stretch of the imagination. At the head of all this abuse were the nuns. Most that stayed at the orphanage refused to talk of their time after the fact, but those that did all had similar stories that regarded the nuns as cruel and vicious. On top of the long days of never-ending work in class, the children were often beaten or sometimes even worse. One boy angered the nuns to a degree unlike any other. It's unclear what he did, but the nuns would go on to either beat him to death or drown him. There are conflicting reports on how he met his end. After his death, his body was stored in the basement for an unusual amount of time, and they reported his death as an accident. 
In another instance, one of the girls from the orphanage was outside during a snowy day without appropriate winter clothing. By the time she made it back inside, it was already too late. Hypothermia had set in, and she would pass away. Instead of being sad and compassionate, the nuns were furious. They took the girl's body and put it on display in the lobby of the orphanage for all the other kids to see with a sign on it that said, This is what happens to children who don't listen. The old lobby is now one of the more haunted portions of the building. Unusually cold temperatures in the old lobby are known to happen frequently. The sound of children giggling has also been heard. A ghostly girl has been spotted in the lobby as well, but as soon as you lay your eyes on her, she'll disappear, almost as if she's playing a game of hide and seek. Throughout the rest of the building, people have reported doors opening and closing on their own, as well as footsteps and running, although no one else will be in the area. The giggling has also been heard in other parts of the building, as well as the sound of children talking, singing, and playing. Visitors have brought in toy cars and balls that will move across the floor on their own. The orphanage has recently been converted into apartments after sitting for years and decaying. Tenants of the new building have still had these paranormal experiences throughout the apartment complex. With the tragic history that occurred within this structure, it'd be hard to believe that the paranormal events are going to stop anytime soon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 54, Marquette, Michigan, our very first episode in Michigan. I'm Jesse Wilkins. I'm joined by Rob Coakley. Hello, Rob. Now, as established, when I eventually kidnap Dave's dead, useless body, we've established this over the course of many episodes, and I finally put it on display, I am going to have a sign in front of it that says, this is what happens to co-hosts who don't listen. All right. Well, that's Rob, and uh, we're also joined by Dave. Hello, Dave. What's up? I have no idea what Rob just said. I wasn't listening. I actually tuned out of that one as well. You know what? It's it's we have Rob's death threats, and eventually we're going to be able to start airing my mother's death threats to Rob for every time that she threatens, (laughs) every time that he threatens Dave's life. (laughs) So we're covering Michigan. It's our first time covering uh, Michigan. I want to say what's up to everybody. It's hanging out in live chat. The usual crowd is here. The Stephanies and everybody else. Victoria came in uh, with a story here. She says, hi, I'm from Bangor, Maine. I live in a house that has five spirits and I have a portal that has been closed for some time now in my basement. That's very interesting. And I'd love to hear more about that. Um, Send us an email if you don't mind. Um, Hometownghoststories at gmail.com. And we would love to hear your ghost stories. And if everybody else has ghost stories, we've got a few of them this week. Um, We're going to review those and check those. I wonder if those five spirits that are in her house are annoyed that she closed their portal without letting them go Mm. back through it. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, let them go back. (laughs) I don't really know how those things work, but no idea. We're we're learning. (laughs) We're learning. It's a learning experience. So, um, yeah, Michigan. It's our first time there. Good. We're we're checking off some more states on the list. We decided that we'll take a little break from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and just continue (laughs) as we just continue to hammer away from it. But, um, yeah, we're gonna add a few more states to the list here, and and try to cover some more locations. But we finally have a haunted orphanage. We've been uh, that's been on the list of creepy places that we haven't covered yet. We do. Why don't we bring our guest in? Very good. So we're joined today by Crystal Quinn. Welcome in, Crystal. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Very good. Good. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So Crystal was sharing some of her paranormal experiences with us before the show. And I feel as though before we jump into Marquette, Michigan, we should hit on the banana land story that you were telling us. (laughs) Actually, I have two of them. Um, I never was really into ghosts or really understood them until first grade. I mean, I guess 
that's still young to learn about ghosts, but I will never forever, ever, ever forget the moment. We are all taking a quiz or a test and inside the first grade classroom, it's an old building. They actually had a smaller bathroom inside of it. And I remember looking up and I see someone walk across the room, very pale, and I've never seen them before. And they walk into where the bathroom is. And then I look around and they were gone. And I try like getting everyone around me to be like, is there someone else here? Everyone thought I was fucking nuts. And I became obsessed after that. And then as I was growing up, I always thought my house was kind of haunted until mm -hmm. but never said anything until my siblings started saying it. And they are not superstitious at all. They're very, um, my one sister, she works in a lab. Uh, my other one's going for her doctor, doctorate being like a doctor and shit. Like she's very, they're all very scientific and they're like, mm -hmm. nope. House is haunted. House is haunted. <laughs> My younger brother was on the bus once and a bus driver told him how a person was hung on a tree, hanged. I'm sorry. It's now hang it's hanged, hanged on a tree outside the house. So I was like, that's a great bus driver to tell a little kid, but that's the person that's haunting the house. So very interesting. I just have an image of this bus driver, just this old scraggly man, just grabbing your brother. Hadn't said a <laughs> word to him all day. Just like, you know, there was a man hanged on that tree over there, don't you? And then just pushing him off the bus. <laughs> Especially <Look at it. laughs> this crazy woman, to be honest. Yeah. I just was imagine it? living in this creepy house with tons of cats, which yeah, I'm kind I was, of- you know, I was definitely it. picturing Brian Cox's character from uh, Trick or Treat as the bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Or, or he's- or he's wearing a long coat and a top hat. Like he, he has a side gig of doing a ferry ride in Thailand. Uh, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. 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 yeah <laughs> Those episodes. Episodes. Oh, nice. Those yeah. yeah. Trick or treat. Oh. One of our favorite movies at hometown ghost stories. Oh, that's my favorite horror film of all times, to be honest. Yeah. We're on the same page there. We both love that as well. All right. So let's start jumping into Marquette, Michigan where so i'm gonna be full disclosure the way i found this is i was like we have not covered a haunted orphanage yet and this is a travesty it has been a year and we haven't done a haunted orphanage so i started looking them up and a lot of the haunted orphanages that i found were in states that we had already covered so we will be circling back to more of these in the future but i wanted to hit a different one and then i found this one and i had never heard of marquette michigan but honestly, it looks beautiful. It looks like a great place to visit. And there's a ton of ghosts. So like it's everything I want. Um, all wrapped into one. Was anyone and you and you, and you managed to squeeze in a, another haunted lighthouse story? Well, you know I'm gonna find the haunted lighthouse. That is just the tradition at this point. If there's a haunted lighthouse, I will seek it out. I will find it and I will cover it. Isn't um, every lighthouse haunted? From so. what from what we've gathered, yeah. literally, we covered Block Island, which is this island that's like three miles by seven miles. They have two lighthouses, and both of them are haunted, which is just so one hundred percent of the lighthouses on the island. Yeah, <laughs> I found a lighthouse that's not haunted, and there's a story. <laughs> right, right. That's what we need to do. We're gonna hometown not go stories, and we're just gonna go cover every house that's not actually haunted. That's the, that's I, the I think it's part of the criteria. Like, is it even a lighthouse if it's not haunted? Right. And every ghost is from the same period, right? Especially. Of course. And, yeah. So the gown and all from like the 1800s or something. Yeah. Yeah. So we can, we can modern Gen Z ghosts going on. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Uh, we can, we can start with the lighthouse though. I actually found the lighthouse story really interesting as I was digging into it with the story of the wife to start so her husband goes off to the civil war and she's left there and she cares for this lighthouse for like three or four years and she's not the only woman doing this across the country and definitely not across michigan i think there were five women that were covering that were like covering for their husband while they were off to war and anastasia specifically i think they were all doing a great job from what i read but anastasia specifically they would they would do surprise inspections on her, right? They would just show up and they would be like, and go through the thing. And, and she would get the best scores out of every lighthouse that they would inspect in the state. And when her husband's finally back and he's not able to do the job, they still say, nah, you can't do it. You're a woman. 
And it's just like, she literally just did it for three years better than anyone else. And you're kicking her and her four kids and her broken husband to the curb. And I was just like, I'd haunt the shit out of that place too. Like dickheads. <laughs> like what are we doing yeah. here? Definitely a spiteful spirit. Yeah, I would be. I mean, it, it's just, it's just so when you see these stories and stuff, it's just so ridiculous. Like the thought process behind it, in my opinion. I actually was taking some notes down as the video was going on and I put people are scarier than ghosts. <laughs> That's it's just, 100% accurate. Case, yeah. yeah I, I was like, ah, I hate the living. I hate the living. Yeah. I know. Surround me with dead people and I'll be happy. Yeah. I mean, it goes back, <laughs> goes back to the Salem witch trials, right? Who was scarier? The, the people that were said to be witches or the people that were claiming everybody was witches. Yeah. Right. Like, the people condemning everybody are terrifying. Well, yeah, I actually, I love the history of witches. I love reading stories of all that. I love witchcraft, that all everything supernatural, to be honest. But it's crazy how it started so many years in Europe about with, mm -hmm. with uh, the witchcraft. Like Salem has nothing to do, like, or not nothing, it has nothing on Europe with those types of uh, the witchcraft over there and people dying just because they were doing, um, there was either a whole bunch of independent women, there, women, there is a um, story of how there was a, a small town and when their husbands were away at war, the women would take care of the town. And next thing you know, um, some missionaries come, came in and they felt a strong attraction to the women because they were so independent. They were witches. Of course. Of course. And, they, of course. Cool. and they murdered all of them. Yeah, and they were, Europe was burning their witches. Which they, I think is help, a they bit worse. Them, they, uh, all of it. Yeah. Horrible torture. Yeah. Salem witch trials. Nothing on what Europe did for centuries. Yeah, we covered a little bit of it in the uh, Edinburgh episode in Scotland, and the judge that is allegedly the poltergeist that now haunts the Greyfriars churchyard. He apparently oversaw. I think it was like thirteen hundred uh, witch trials and executions. And you think, wow, like, you know, we're talking about somewhere around like 19 witches in Salem. Compare that to thousands of witches there. And I don't want to diminish what happened in Salem. Obviously, that was awful as well. But it's just the sheer number of witch yeah. trials and executions that happened in Europe is is horrifying. And Salem isn't the only place in America that it was happening as well. But the numbers are much higher overseas. Um, while we were doing all that, because Crystal has a better background than me, I actually called the police and reported her as a witch. So if mm. she gets... <laughs> Hauled off in the middle he, of this episode. We he called the European it. police, though, so it's going to take yeah. We'll finish <laughs> off the episode. Right, I'll yeah. Right. yeah, so. But, but this lighthouse, the difference with this lighthouse than some of the other ones that we've covered, um, not all the other ones that we covered, but there are multiple spirits in this lighthouse. And you have Anastasia, you have Robert Sales, who is the only reported death in the lighthouse. We saw a picture of him and his family in front of it. And then there's the children that they can't really explain who it is. There's David. So the other weird part of this is two of the ghosts at this lighthouse. One is named De one is named Dave, David. One's named Jesse. And I almost killed the episode because of that. I was almost like, no one's going to believe me that I found this story with ghosts. If there was like a Rob and Crystal in it, I would have just burned the episode and just been like, we're not doing this because... It actually, just doesn't, if that were the case, it would be ridiculous not to do the episode. It, I mean, it just is like, I'm like, I'm going to get called out in chat for this one. But but that's who they're, they're not sure about the girl, though. I think that's just a name that they've, you know how like sometimes they just name the spirit. They don't know who it actually is. So they just give it a name. They're like, what's so the, girliest, think, the girliest name we can think of? We'll yeah. Give that, give that to the spirit. Who's the most right. feminine man we know? <laughs> and that's Jesse. So that's what they went with. He's clearly not listening to us. I'm over here fine. trying. I'm over here trying to fix our Discord link and uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so that that link that I posted earlier, in chat, folks, is, uh, <laughs> was actually the incorrect Discord server. So that's uh, like my personal server, but the, we do have the hometown ghost stories one. I just updated it, so you guys can uh, now join the Discord there, and I'll update the link. I know the old one had expired, but anyways, if you're looking to contact us and send us your ghost stories, Discord's another way to do it, and the correct Discord link is now in chat. So check that out. So the other thing about this lighthouse before we start diving a little more into the ghost is it seems to be like almost the centerpiece of Marquette. And I say that in terms of like every video I looked up about Marquette, 
they would show the lighthouse. So it seems like that is like, they're very proud of this lighthouse and you can actually tour the lighthouse in the summer and go on ghost tours in it. And they do the paranormal investigations and everything. I don't think you can do it like this time of year because it's too cold and there's no heating system within it. But during the summer, you can actually go investigate. So it'd be a pretty cool spot to go check out. For sure. Give, especially give if Rob any excuse to go check out a lighthouse. Yeah. <laughs> the only time I've seen Rob discouraged from going to go see a lighthouse is when there was no road access and we had to walk across an entire beach to get to the one in Block Island. <laughs> And we're, we're standing there looking at it. We're like, that looks deceptively far away and um, or deceptively far away. And it was, it was a, it was a long trek on. It was a, end. it was a sub 10 minute walk. Everyone relax. Yeah. That was too far there. 10 minutes walking on the beach is different than 10 minutes walking on like the road. Oh yeah. You're sinking in. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have to walk up the lighthouse. Yeah. Well, yeah. we couldn't, we, we couldn't get into the lighthouse. It was locked, but. We might be investigating that lighthouse in the next few months. Maybe there's a, there's a potential. Yeah, yeah it's been uh, it's in the works. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. So Papa Squatch says, tune in next week to Rob's lighthouse stories. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah, channels. I was going to say, you guys got to check out the uh, down in Cape May. There is a very haunted lighthouse. Yes. Cape, yeah, Cape May is one of the ones I was looking at for, oh. for a potential episode. <laughs> it's good. So we have all these different ghosts in this lighthouse, but nothing's like mean spirited or anything like that. It's mostly just kids playing and Anastasia like Anastasia seems to be more of a residual haunting, which is a little weird because this is not the exact lighthouse she was in. They built this lighthouse, right? The one that she maintained, but they built it out of like the worst materials possible. And within 20 years, they had to replace the entire thing. And it was nothing to do with maintenance or anything like that because she kept it immaculate, but they just used like they were so close to the water. It just got demolished by the elements. And now she's still haunting the new lighthouse and still doing like activities that she would have been doing on the old one. So it's a little bit of an interesting twist for her. It's one of the uh, situations where or you wonder if the um, the renovations made the haunting worse. Yeah. Usually ghosts don't like, or spirits, whatever you want to call them, they don't usually like it when you change things. They get mm -hmm. very, very angry because it's their home, their their comfort there. And then next thing you know, it's changed. You don't like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah there's, a, there's a couple of beliefs that, that could be tied to that. So one is, you know, you're renovating, you're changing the house that they lived in, like you just said, and they're angry about that. The other feeling is that they could be trapped within walls or trapped within um, certain stones. We talked about the stone tape theory plenty of times on the show. And when you all of a sudden you break down a wall or something like that, you're releasing energy or water or, or memories or whatever that have been trapped inside that wall for a long time. And that's why a lot of times when you have renovation crews that are demolishing a house or renovating a house or whatever, you've heard uh, on, on quite a few episodes now of these entire teams just getting up and walking out. They're like, nah, this place is crazy. It's haunted doors are slamming they're seeing ghosts they're hearing things and you get like this extreme heightened level of hauntings that happens for a few days and then as things settle down it the hauntings die down and um yeah. it's pretty common that, that and there's so many ghost stories that you hear like oh yeah as soon as we started renovating that's when the haunting started it's very common and the great thing about this haunted lighthouse is if we do go investigate it we can stay in the haunted hotel that's that's in Marquette, which is the landmark in. Um, I'm going to be completely upfront and honest. I looked for any evidence of this supposed murder that took place of the woman. And I couldn't find anything to back it up at all, which could be poor record keeping. It could be a cover up because of the woman's profession. You know, it'd be early 1900s we know how that whole situation went down a lot of the times or it could just be nonsense but the when was the when did it take place the murder do you know somewhere in the 1910s when the building was being was being built i think it took mm. 15 years for this hotel to be built though if i remember correctly like, why did it take so long i couldn't find out why i wonder if they just like were 
funding was shutting down, you know, like one of those weird situations. You've ever seen those buildings in your town where it's just like, why is nothing happening to this at all? Even when it's complete. We have one here in Bridgewater that right by that hall we did the the live show at. There's been a restaurant that's been set up for 20 years ready for someone to move in and nobody's ever moved into this building. The sign to rent it has just been there for 20 years, brand new building. And you're just like, what is going on there? So um, just weird little stuff like that. But the murder potentially happened, potentially didn't. The woman did die on the sixth floor, though. The one whose husband died in like a um, a accident at sea or on the water. She definitely did die. And it's actually what I find the most compelling of this hotel is the sixth floor. Yeah, so he was out at sea and just never returned. So there's, they don't know whether they assume he died. I mean, eventually he died, obviously, one way or another. But uh, uh, you can't prove it. He could have just, I mean, he could have just split, didn't come back. Either way, she was uh, super depressed about it. And she mm-hmm. tied multiple lilac imprinted napkins together and um, used them to hang herself out the uh, sixth floor window. Surprised it held up. Yeah. I well, think- napkins in the 19. 19- tens were uh cloth not like napkins like oh of course paper. Yeah. yeah you have to seriously tie them in a knot for that to not get loose That's yeah for them not to yeah, arts well, and I mean, her husband was a sailor so she probably knew knew how to tie a, a, a solid knot that's a good point mm, yeah so that so the what i find the most interesting we have our normal hauntings on the sixth floor the the apparition that appears throughout the hallway what i found more interesting though i mean Obviously, an apparition appearing would be terrifying, and I would be scared, and I would run. But the fact that the front desk is getting calls from rooms where no guests are staying. Mm. like I like that. We haven't heard that one yet, and it's happened multiple times, and it's always like on the sixth floor where just rooms will call, and they go, and they check, and no one's in the room. It's fully, it's like the room's immaculate. No one's been in there. And they're just getting these calls and people are just breathing into the microphone, into the phone and then just hanging up. That is interesting. We got something relatively similar to that with the Emily Morgan Hotel, where you have those phones that are out, not necessarily in the lobby. But when you get off the elevator to each floor, there was a, mm-hmm. a phone sitting there and they said that, that those phones would phantom ring from time to time and there would never be anybody on the other end of that. So it's one of the tales. So uh, relatively similar, but not uh, not identical. Mm. Thing that's so interesting is you can't fake it when it's coming from a room that no one's in or has a key to. I mean, maybe you can say, oh, a housekeeper went in there or something. But if it happens that often, I don't think they're really messing with themselves, I guess you can say. It's like it's something you can't even blame on technology or just electrical issues. If someone... Right, because of the breathing. Exactly. If there's so actually something happening. Yeah, yeah. there's too many, too many variables that conflict with each other that Make it make no sense. Matthew Thomas says, clean rooms. That's how I know these ghosts can't be kids. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Well, we, we had to get a couple adult ghosts in this one because when we hit the lighthouse with a couple kids and we're going to be talking about the orphanage in a few minutes, I had to find some sort of balance in between there. And, uh, and also the phone thing really caught my attention. I'm like, if nothing else, we need to have a discussion about these phones because we do see a lot of hauntings that are the same thing, which is really good because now we're establishing like, you know, the same thing over and over again in different locations. But when we get an outlier like this, that's a little different. It's, uh, it's almost, it's almost scarier. Like seeing a woman apparition would be terrifying, but can you imagine just like working at this hotel, being at the front desk, getting a call from room 610, hearing this like heavy breathing, and then it's just hanging up and you look up the room and you're like, nobody's in that room. Mm-hmm. Are you even going to be the one to Quit. go check it? Or are you going to be like, hey, Jesse, I need you to go take a look at 610. <laughs> see what's going on in there. <laughs> Make sure uh, there's nothing weird happening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna stay here at the front desk, right? Like, So mm-hmm. you need to go. Don't somebody's worry about mine. Somebody's got to man the front desk. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't worry about why I'm asking you to do this. It's it's no big deal. Just we it's something we do here. Yeah, I think there's a, like a dirty towel in there you have to get or something. You know, I think it's locked down. Someone left something in there. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
You'll be fine. Don't you won't die. I swear. Why did you mention dying? Don't worry about it. Just go ahead. <laughs> Don't ask questions. <laughs> I wonder what happened if you left um, lilac napkins in that one room. Oh, that's like an offering or something like that. Crystal, we have we have a job for you. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan. We're going to find you some lilac, ma Michigan, <laughs> lilac napkins and we're going to send you to Michigan and you're going to report on what happens in this room. Done. Absolutely. The, 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 chat, other the chat is desperately asking for ghost pirates too. So if you could also look around and see if there's any uh, <laughs> ghost pirates that have sailed the Great Lakes, then you let us know. <laughs> pirate hat, pirate outfit and with the yeah. lilac napkins. We Maybe can take care of the pirate hats for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> oh, we got a fourth? <laughs> Ah, yes. That's what I've been doing this whole episode is putting this together. Go, I really had a crouch to put these ones on, but yeah, anyways. Yeah. It Success. We did it. We managed to get a state not on the ocean, some pirate talk. So that's that's perfect. Well, you so, the lighthouse, we just get by default, we just automatically have to talk about pirates. So right. Um so here's the other thing, though, with this place. We we talk about the hauntings in the basement and the supposed murder that may or may not have happened, but this woman could just be haunting the whole building from the sixth floor, right? They're hearing sobbing and stuff in the basement. Who's to say that it's not her going into the basement and sobbing? It yeah, I feel like hotels, hotels like to do this, where they like to designate a, a ghost to just one floor. Right. But there's no reason why the spirit couldn't be haunting the entire building. Ghosts yeah. can use elevators. That's right. That's true. And stairs. But if I just go right through the floor, we don't make the rules. That's right. Definitely use the elevator. Ghost rules. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do well, we? More people weren't, weren't murdered in that hotel. Especially well, in the. True. And that's something we talk about with a lot of hotels. We don't know what was going on in a lot of these rooms or things that have happened. Like, think of just like taking a camera, right? And putting it in a hotel room and just being able to scan through like 40 or 50 years of just that one hotel room, oh my you're, God. you're gonna see some shit, right? Just one hotel room. And now we're just talking about an entire hotel. Who knows what you're gonna see there? Like it's it's actually terrifying. Mm -hmm. it, it's terrifying to think as when you so I, every time you guys go to a hotel now, I want you to think of everything that could have possibly happened in that room that you're walking into and about to stay in. And in, in the history, yeah, it could be a lot. That's what that's it's another reason why we discuss this a lot. Um, when talking about the Hawthorne Hotel, is I lean more heavily on stories from the staff than stories from somebody who stayed at the hotel for one night. Now, of course, a haunting could happen and you could have your own experience, but when the hotel is collecting all of the stories from the guests that are terrified and the guests that want to change rooms, not necessarily just your average person who stays at a hotel for a night and is like, oh, it was haunted. But when you have someone that's there every day, employees that work there, maids that are there, um, just the stories that come from the staff themselves at these hotels are, are uh, very compelling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And especially the ones that end up quitting because they're so petrified. That's a yeah. big one. Yeah. Well, right? And I've heard a lot of them also happening in restaurants, bartenders that are constantly quitting, people that can't keep bartenders because certain bars are haunted. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have one of those in... Um, San Antonio, the Menger Hotel, um, goes to Teddy Roosevelt, scared that, scared that man right out of his job. <laughs> yeah. Did I, have I told you guys what the building I work in used to do, like before it was what my company is? I probably um, worded that poorly, but um, so they used the building that I'm in now back in the day as storage for the science museum. And there was one room in the building that they stored all of the mummies for a oh. long time and oh. there have been stories in the building that i work in about some shit being seen personally i haven't seen it myself but um it's a That's big scary thing it is it is pretty <laughs> scary Did you ask around i want to refer to cody's comment here because i believe this is the second person that had mentioned this he says there are stories of ghost pirate ships on the great lakes are they just lost were there pirates? I mean, were there pirates on the? I mean, they're so big. I mean, I guess if they're shipping things back and forth from Canada, the United States, or whatever, and mm -hmm. somebody's like, you know what, this is a prime opportunity that nobody's capitalizing on. I'm going to go pirate some of these supply ships. They'll never see it coming. Maybe I don't know. Where do they stop? They go to lakes. 
what are your, lo- your local pond just has like one pirate ship roaming around the middle just hoping that's the one <laughs> <laughs> oh they hit the one fisherman again today yeah. <laughs> i think the great um, lakes are massive yeah they are <clears throat> Do we want to hit on anything else in this hotel or do we want to move on to the orphanage? Let's move on to the orphanage. Some spooky, scary children. Mm. Yeah. So I think we see this a lot with these hospitals that are built in like the early 1900s, late 1800s. It's the same story with these orphanages where like they are built for good reasons. Like there's, there's goodwill behind it, but almost immediately like it just starts off negative like especially with this one right so it's built well it wasn't all good intention because they only wanted it to be white children which you know 1900s like that's segregation was a big thing but instead of it instead of doing that they get even worse than segregation they're like we're not going to segregate. We're going to go steal 60 Native American children from their tribes and bring them to this orphanage and never tell them of their history and just like adopt them out so that we can like basically like convert them. Like, yeah, they, they were convert them to Catholic, right? Yeah. It was, were... yeah, Catholic and they were trying to get to, it was like their way of trying to integrate them better into society, which is, uh, unnecessary and, and completely ridiculous so and, and a lot of these and we talk about like oh well you know as they were built with good intentions and unfortunately it's like like there was no hope for good intentions because the way right. that these not just orphanages but um sanatoriums asylums the way that they operated back in the day was just with sheer brutality right mm-hmm. and the, the the methods of treatment were brutal because they didn't know it not i'm not making excuses but they didn't know anything else that the science just wasn't advanced so you get when you talk about tuberculosis and they're treating that they're just opening up the chest being like oh let's find the tuberculosis <laughs> and they're, they're open up the chest let's air them out for a week like they, they didn't know what the hell they were doing and uh it was just almost barbaric with with a lot of the the ways that they handled things and i mean this just goes to show why so many of these locations have become so infested with ghosts is it just when you have traumatic and, and bad events like that, then you deal with a creepy place. And I think it's potentially next level creepy when we're talking about an orphanage and ghost children. So w- when you first sent me this location, I was like, all right, let me look into it. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, this just sounds like a nice place. Just a bunch of nuns and a bunch of kids. And have you ever met like, nuns? Yeah. Have you ever <laughs> met nuns? I've met a few in there that now I've, I've met the most splendid nuns on the planet. So I can't speak ill of, of nuns due to my experience, but we're talking about a different era here. You know how many of them were nice, Jesse? You want to guess? <laughs> None. <laughs> so Rob, were you not expecting that answer? <laughs> I knew, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. And I was just, my internal, all of my body was cringing, but I just had to. <laughs> I had to I had to let it happen and I'm sorry I did. Crystal, I'm sorry you had to witness that. That's okay. Really it, ha- it happens at least once a week and we, we just kind of deal with it. Um yeah, so so yeah, the nuns were brutal. And just to like expand upon your point, Jesse, not only is bad things happening, but it's happening at like an alarming rate. Like it's not like you know, once a month, once a year, it's like hourly. Like Bad shit is happening in these buildings hourly. They're they're the kids are getting punished. There there's brutal things going on like everywhere, and we don't even know the full extent. Half of these kids wouldn't even talk about their experiences from the time that they were in there. Like they didn't even want to relive it, and that's totally understandable. Like if it was that tragic and that bad, you don't, you don't want to talk about it. Sometimes you just don't want to have to relive that. So right. And we the town doesn't necessarily want to embrace the brutality of the location, especially since the location didn't get demolished. It's, it's still there and it got turned into apartments. So they're like, no, no, no. I mean, maybe it wasn't so bad. They have like this one resident guy who's like, he was a child at the orphanage. Mm-hmm. And every time they're doing a news report on him, they always refer to this guy. He's like, it was great. And they, they have their one person who has like a, <laughs> like a positive experience. Like, oh, see? See? Everything's fine. No abuse. Everything's yeah, fine. There's a yeah. nun with a ruler off screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. But the whole thing is like, it wasn't even 
built with good energy. So there can't be nothing, like even the land itself. I can't imagine if there's any mm. stories of the apartments or the people that live in the apartments. I would love to know that kind of stuff because that land itself is nothing but negative energy. Yeah. So they they actually, the apartments are converted out of the old building. They didn't. That's, who wants to live there? <laughs> <laughs> Right, that's the crazy um, that they were actually able to to restore this building. Like, if you, I'm sure Rob, you saw some images of it in some walkthroughs of this video a few years ago when it was just dilapidated and it just mm -hmm. it looked like nothing would save this building but a wrecking ball. And for them to actually flip it into apartments, like that, must have been a hell of a effort, and it must have they must have dumped a ton of money into that project. That that video I showed. Good. Sorry, that video I showed on the pre-produced section were kids that broke into the orphanage so that that video of like that dilapidated disgusting building was this building that is now apartments and i have come across some stories like a few things of people hearing stuff and seeing stuff within their apartments but these apartments have only been open for like four or five years at the most i think at this point so we might be seeing more stories trickle out in time on that did they convert the whole building or or just Un part of it is, is Un part of it i'm unclear on that to be honest i think they converted most of the building i don't think it's the whole building for, from the pictures that i saw it looks like just the front of the building has a but i, I don't know i could be completely wrong about that it's a huge mm -hmm. building to to convert the whole thing into apartments but um i would assume they started with a few and then they're going to continue to to add them on as they go but i'm just completely shooting from the hip here so who knows <laughs> hometown yeah. architecture stories yeah <laughs> so some of the some of the stories in the history on it that you went over were, were pretty wild so immediately immediately mm -hmm. there was like no time between when the place opened to immediate reports of abuse and neglect going on here mm -hmm. it didn't sound like it was massively overcrowded for a building that size i think the peak was around 200 kids so it didn't sound like it was massively overcrowded but the brutality and the stories that came out of this are wild and I don't know how much our legend and how much are are rooted in in fact, but I heard multiple sources that that confirmed the case of this little girl who was outside playing in the snow. Mm -hmm. And I believe you talked about this one in the story. And she was out there for a while. And one of the nuns eventually was like, I guess I have to go get her and went out into the snow to get her. And by the time she pulled her in, it was basically too late. Kid had hypothermia, died. And that's not even the messed up part of the story. The messed up part of the story is to teach uh, to make an example out of this kid, they put the kid on display for like a couple of weeks and showed yeah. basically all the other kids like, Hey, if you don't obey the rules, this is what happens to you is you die. Put a sign just... on her, like on her body and put her in the lobby of the orphanage where everyone's walking through. Imagine being so mad that a child went outside and like, because you were neglectful, you're pissed off that the child died. You're like, see, See what happens when you're an idiot and you're five years old and the adults don't. And take you just want to build a snowman. <laughs> yeah. See what happens when you want to have fun. This and... is so archaic form. Of, like this is stuff you hear in like medieval times. And this is the yeah. happened in the 20th century. This yeah. bananas. It was built in 1915. Yeah. 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 That's really not that crazy long ago when you think about it as that kind of behavior. Right. It's it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't. And these places got away with this stuff. Like they, they didn't get in trouble for it. Like it, it's just unbelievable to think of that. You could be that archaic and put a body on display for two weeks. And this one is confirmed from multiple sources. Some of the kids that were there have talked about it and say that this did happen. The timeline of how long she was displayed is like murky. But it's somewhere between like it's multiple days at minimum. And to think of you would actually watch her body then just deteriorate and go mm -hmm. through that process is has to be insane for another child to see. Right. I think the two weeks thing has to be exaggerated because the stage of decomposition that body would have been in would have been Unbearable. A, puddle, a puddle. It would have been unless, unless they kept bringing it back out in the snow just to freeze it again. Oh my God. <laughs> but even but even if it's oh, three big, days big brain over there <laughs> but even if it's three days like it's it's, it's, it's any any amount of days 
yeah, any amount of any, any amount of the, the beginning of that process is it's, it's it. yeah, it's just like so. Of course, this girl is haunting this building, right? Like again, like I'd be pissed off. Like you allowed this to happen to me, and then you made a mockery of my death afterwards. Like yeah, like, like this is a five year old underdressed for the snow. It is immediately your fault, not the kid's fault. If that kid ends up outside. Right. My kids would wander outside. They're seven and five years old. They, they would just go. <laughs> you know, they, they don't want to be stopped. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's absolutely on the nuns. And I feel like, um, I don't know. That's just, it's a brutal story. It yeah, is. Did, did you say why the orphanage was shut down? Was that so? Uh, um, I didn't say why. I think. They just ran out of orphans. I mean, so no, they just stopped orphanage. Orphanage just stopped being a thing at some point. Right. Yeah, in general, so, mostly just foster care. Yeah, um, the so, in, in the early stages of this, it was the orphans were much more frequent. Like there was obviously, if the parents died, there'd be no one to take care of the kids. Your regular reasons, they'd be orphans. Then the other, it was just much higher. Like if the wife died, a lot of times in, in this period of time, the father would be like, "Well, off to the orphanage. Like I can't care for these children. I have to work 14 hours a day. And so they would drop them off. A lot of times they wouldn't drop them off permanently. They would drop them off, be like, take care of this kid for two years so I can get my shit straight, find a new wife, and then I'll take my kid back. And uh, that's why it was, there was so many kids going in and out of there. Um, there was also opened, but... families having way too many kids. And as they would have more kids than they could handle, like say they had five and then like they had a six kid and they're like, well, can't handle this six kid. The mm -hmm. six kid would go to the orphanage and they would keep the other five, which is like, as a parent, I mean, how do you're you... the first one? The first one was probably like a mistake or a burnt one. Like, yeah, okay. you know, yeah, but that one can work. That's the problem. That one can go work on the farm or something to bring you back some money. So that's he's he's like four years old at that point. Time to get a full full time job. So what year did this orphanage shut down? It was the late. The late 1960s, it started to really curtail off, and the orphans that they were bringing in were mostly from like Puerto Rico and stuff like that. They weren't local. Um, and from all accounts, from what I was reading in the 60s, it really wasn't that bad of a place anymore, supposedly. I mean, we're going off of, you know, yeah, that's kind of how I felt about it. And then it closed in the 70s and but it remained like office space for like three or four years then yeah, by 1980s it, it was completely empty yep it said um it sat abandoned for quite some time before it got flipped into apartments uh big shout out to dr shavers thank you for the 10 month subscription my man thank you thank you thank you um yeah so the, I, I would say the ghost of that little girl is definitely haunting what are the other the, so I, I had also heard about i don't know if you touched on it there's a like a green mist um at the location where I think a young boy died in the. Yeah. We're going to talk about the boy real quick. And then we're going to cover the green mist in a few moments when we cover some of the stuff that we didn't talk about in Marquette. Uh, but basically the, the story of the boy that died in the orphanage is the one I hit on in the episode. The nuns either drowned him or beat him to death. Pick your poison on which one you'd rather have there. They both sound awful. And supposedly they kept his body in the basement for a while and they they marked his death as an accident. They're like, oh, it was an accident. Like imagine like this body of this boy beaten to death or drowned, and you're just yeah. Uh, this place kind of pisses me off. I think this is gonna be the bit. the resounding thing every time we cover an orphanage, is you're we're just gonna be angry because of what happened to these to these kids. Um mm -hmm. But yeah, so that that spirit is supposed to haunt the house, uh, the orphanage. Anything we want to hit on in the orphanage before we continue on? Because I think this is a good place to pick up the story of the green mist. Yeah, Let's do the green mist. It's here, but right. mist. we got a pink mist with Marilyn Monroe. We've gotten white mists and blue mist before. This is the first pink mist. A new hue. green mist. Green mist. Green mist. It's a new hue. Yeah, not right, good. Dave, you have this one. Right? Ectoplasm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dave's Dave, got a good one on behind him. Perfect. Yes. That's right. It's Dave, you have this. You have this story, right? I don't think I do. Do I? 
You do. It's the one we were discussing before the oh, show. Oh, is it the um okay. the hole in the cemetery ground? So the cemetery, gotcha. So uh, this is Park Cemetery in Marquette. So numerous ghost stories surround Park Cemetery on 7th Street in Marquette. But one of the most shocking relates to the haunting of Old City Orphanage. People walking through the cemetery have noted a large hole in the ground near a gravesite created for a boy beaten to death by a nun in the Old City Orphanage. Oddly enough, around the same time, Somebody first reported a hole in the ground to the cemetery staff. Sighting started of a green sighting started of a green glow in the orphanage basement. Apparently, all on its own, the green glow disappeared, and the hole in the ground ended up neatly filled and covered with flowers. So these two things happen at the same time, mm. which is pretty weird. I'm yeah, so glad we have our spooky music on deck now. Weird. Yeah, <laughs> adds to all the spooky stories completely threw me off <laughs> sorry <laughs> it also threw your mic off for a minute for a little while you were very quiet but you came back and everything's fine yeah. the stream yard didn't know what to do with those levels no, 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 no. <laughs> what is happening you gave us an extra person and music this week <laughs> <laughs> too much yeah, exactly um yeah so like the the whole thing being completely leveled off and neat and flowered that's the part that was like pretty eye-opening to me even more so than the green mist i would say the flowers kind of make me sad. Mm. Like the green mask, I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool, kind of like special effect ish. But like the flowers is just a gives you a different feeling. Mm. More of a sentimental kind of feeling. Yeah, it does. Uh, but Kathy, maybe she says, uh, why would seeing a ghost be terrifying if you're hunting for a ghost? I'd smile and nod to the ghost. Yeah, I think I think most of the stories that we allude to here are not our own. This is of other people's stuff. So I think if they're not looking for a ghost and you see one, probably terrifying. When we see a ghost, we're like, yeah. It's a pretty <laughs> funny observation, though, is the ghost hunters. When they find a ghost, they get scared of the ghost. It's like, but you're looking for it. <laughs> the evidence can still be startling at times, like, like mm -hmm. regardless of. I mean, we don't have like a ton of like sighting sightings. We've seen things that we can't and can't explain and heard things that we can't explain. Um, but can, occasionally when you catch something off, when something catches you off guard, you can, you can get spooked by it, even if you're out there hunting for it. Yeah, so, fuck that. I wanted to leave the Oliver house when we did that one. I didn't want to be in there. Yeah, Oliver house, me? Emily's, Emily's bridge. That was, you know, we've had a few that were actually kind of scary. So. Yeah. so I actually work with someone that was a production assistant on one of the big ghost hunting uh, shows. And mm -hmm. he said, very rarely do they actually catch something, but when it did, it freaked them out to where he has it on his phone. He's like, here's the raw footage from my phone. And he it, he was petrified, petrified, because you don't really expect it and for it to be so clear as well mm -hmm. with some of them. He was not expecting it. Yeah, I mean, we're very much amateurs when it comes to the actual investigations. We've done enough over time. But like, I would say a few of the most compelling things we got on camera. One of them was at the Houghton Mansion when we got the doors to close, and we were just pumped. We're like high fiving, and you know, we were just having it. It was awesome. We're like, oh, we tell the ghost to close the door, and it does it. It was just, it was an awesome experience. So it, it is different. You know, each one is different. It also depends on the setting, and uh, and who you're investigating with for sure. So then I have a question for you guys. Do you guys ever do any protection? Do you guys do any cleansing? Are you guys ever scared that you're going to bring something back with you? My wife is very scared that I'm going to bring something back. So she does all the, uh, she burns the sage and stuff and does all the cleansing things because she, she she actually hates when I go to the haunted locations. Mm -hmm. So Jesse's but, house but, is already haunted. So it doesn't it is. matter. Yeah. It caught the, we had to have uh, priests come by and do like an exorcism thing at my house. So, which I, I wasn't too excited about it, but the wife was like, okay, enough's enough. We're doing it. So they came by and did that. But okay. since then, things have started picking up again. It, they took a, the, the ghosts took about a year off and now hauntings are, are happening pretty regularly again, which is. Did the priest, when the priest came to exercise the house, did he bring any nuns to rough you up? <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. Yeah. Crazy he, he, did, he did slap me though. He's like, this is what the nuns would have done. <laughs> <laughs> Did your uh, ghost take off of, for COVID, I guess. What's that? Did your ghost take off for COVID? Yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Come back, Come back yeah. stronger. Right. Um, I luckily don't live in the haunted house anymore, which is great. It's great to be the one that doesn't have the haunted house anymore, as um, as we've alluded to in the past. Yeah, you just live in a former funeral home. So 
Yeah, it's fine. Actually, Gotham will not go into the front hall in this house. Like, he refuses to go into the front hallway. He will not go into it. And if I pick him up and bring him into it, he freaks out. And he will not go into the basement. Uh, I thought it was the stairs at first. Yeah, see, he's already pissed. He's leaving the room right now. (laughs) Uh, um, I told you to stop talking about me on the show. (laughs) But I thought it was the staircase at first, why he wouldn't go into the basement. But I opened the bulkhead where it's just like two stairs to get down. And if I carry him into the basement, he starts crying and he freaks out and he runs out of the basement. Oh, in a basement of a funeral parlor would have been the morgue, right? Or where where the... Yeah, that's probably where they would have done the embalming and everything, right? Mm, it's probably yeah. it's probably different in each one. Like, so I live next to a funeral. Home. I just I have all the creepy locations. I live right next to a funeral home, and uh, and I could tell they do all that stuff. They have like a back building, like a, a separate, completely separated, like garage almost situation where you could tell they do all that stuff. Mm. So I might be cool. wrong. I haven't gone and looked at it. it could just be a garage, but I assume I, I always see the hearses backing up to that uh, that little building over there and stuff. Mm. Or the vans, anyways. Whatever you transport bodies in. Um, all right. So to get back to the hauntings, we have the old Catholic cemetery as well. Uh, previously previously referred to as the old Catholic cemetery, the pioneer Catholic cemetery in Marquette, Michigan, was used by early European settlers of Marquette County beginning in the mid-1800s. Um, the cemetery was filled to capacity in 1908, at which point, the location began to fall into a state of neglect and disrepair. Between 1912 and 1925, over 160 historic headstones and burial sites were relocated to the nearby Holy Cross Cemetery in an attempt to prevent further deterioration. However, many of the bodies associated with the grave sites were unable to be located, which is bonkers. For this reason, Pioneer Catholic Cemetery is said to be haunted by the spirits of those men and women whose final resting places were disinterred and who may still be mar- buried in unmarked graves. On paranormal enthusiasts and other visitors to the historic cemetery often report hearing the sounds of disembodied voices, whispers, and sobs, as well as feeling the presence of an unseen entity. Um, how? How are they not finding these bodies? What, what happened here? What is this? It doesn't they, even make sense. They decomposed completely, maybe. It's a hell of a decomposition. Yeah. Yeah. Where are the bones? Like you have Bo- the headstone. Bones break you... down. Too. I mean, how? I mean, how? So they're buried. How old are the? Was it just from the eighteen hundreds or? Fucking Michigan, Dave. It's not like it's you know. <laughs> maybe maybe it's like grave robbers. Maybe the bodies got duck up and sold to hospitals or something. It started in the mid eighteen hundreds. So these yeah. graves were Matthew Thomas's not... aliens. Mm-hmm. Could be aliens, yep. yep. Yeah, it's crazy. So, like, where where did the bodies go? Like, were people? Maybe it was grave robbers. Maybe they were stealing these bodies and doing something with them. Yeah, yeah. man. That that's yeah. what I was saying. Is maybe maybe because we've dealt with a few of those cases before, where they would uh, dig up fresh bodies and sell them to medical schools at the time that were looking for fresh bodies to do uh, tests on. Mm. So. I mean, I don't really have any other explanation, to be honest, other than grave robbers. Unless it was a very shallow grave and animals got to it, but I doubt that. Yeah, I doubt that as well. Did they say about the evidence of what okay. was going on with the graves? No, they, there was no reports. They just said they couldn't find the bodies. So, I'm so David, after, David was just typing vigorously. What'd you find? After skeletonization, if scavenging animals do not destroy or remove the bones, acids in many fertile soils take about 20 years to completely dissolve a skeleton. Huh. Really? That's got to be if it's not even in a coffin at all. Yeah. Oh, so was it, that's just if it's dumped in like a mass grave? Uh, apparently, yeah. So if soil. You, but the um, the wood breaks down and eventually. So they, I guess. So that's why they put the concrete things over it. So you don't get like big like indents in the. That's uh, for the zombies, Dave. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, d- dual purposes it serves, but um, but yeah. Chris, I don't know. But you've been in a few zombie movies, correct? So yeah. you you are a resident zombie expert from here on forth. Is that why there is concrete on the on the graves? Depends on which zombie you're talking about, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even think concrete can really like save you as much. No, uh, good to know. Yeah, and uh, Rachel brings up a good point that if there's if it's a grave that's close to trees, the roots can sometimes go through the coffin and speed up that process. 
Hmm. Didn't think about that. That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, this site says a body can completely de decompose inside of a coffin after about 100 years. So that's pretty close to how long it was, right? When they Dave, I think you should get in a coffin now and we can <laughs> test this theory. You got one? You would pull one out of the basement of your house? <laughs> <laughs> I should. Um, and the, the last one I have is the Marquette Monthly Magazine building. The Marquette Monthly building in just, they just say Marquette too many times in these stories. This is why I like writing my own stuff. Um, it was constructed in 1908 as Labonte's Grocery Store, which remained in business until the 1990s. It was then used as a gift shop called Summer Cottage for a short time before being purchased by a publishing company called the Marquette Monthly in 1999. Employees of the Marquette M Monthly and residents living in the building's third floor apartment often report experiencing an array of paranormal activity, including lights turning on and off by themselves, objects being moved or thrown across the room by an unseen entity, and hearing the sounds of disembodied footsteps and voices. Although the cause of the alleged paranormal phenomena is unknown, one popular urban legend claims that the old building is haunted by the spirit of a woman named Beth Ann, who died tragically on the third floor after her shirt became entangled in the paper feeding mechanism of an old printing press. But the story was later debunked as being fictional by Marquette author and historian Tyler, someone in a 2018 book titled Haunted Marquette Ghost Stories from the Queen City. Shut up, Tyler. Tyler's no fun. I like yeah, that Tyler's story. ruining everything. Way to go, Tyler. Such a yeah. Tyler move, right? Like uh -huh. every Tyler you know would do that. Yeah. He's also has a best friend named Brad and Chad. Most likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their kids Karen. are definitely. Kids are definitely named Aiden and Brayden. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Arrow for right, some reason. We're, 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 we're thinning out our listeners by insulting all the new names. <laughs> so sorry to all the Tylers, the Aidens, the Braydens, the Chads, the Thads, the Brads. We apologize that we love when you listen. I got a message that said uh, many people, um, this is from my mother, who said uh, they had their former house blessed and many people get their um, new houses blessed. I know that. This was different. We also got our house blessed when we first got it, but this was a straight up exorcism at our house to, to an extent where the priest warned us. He's like, listen, if... Um, things start rattling around the house and plates start falling off uh, out of cabinets and all this kind of stuff. That's okay. Don't worry. I'm like, is it okay if I start filming if that happens? <laughs> <laughs> Wife's like, shut up. I'm like, okay, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we yeah. need the stock footage. Don't you yeah, understand? Exactly. <laughs> this is perfect. Set up some secret hidden cameras next time. <laughs> He would have probably, he would have probably been like, wait, you've been visiting what kind of locations? You fucking idiot. This is all your fault. <laughs> You trapped a poltergeist in a box. <laughs> <laughs> we said that to Captain McSlug's house just to be safe, though. So we did. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Papa Squatch um, says my real name is Tyler. So see that? See how it starts? Here we go. So you you guys oh. <laughs> you guys get you get caught by the chat every time. They they just they lie to you and you pull the comment up and you fall for it every time. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. We are suckers. Oh. Yeah. His, his, real, <laughs> his real name is Squatch. So uh, yeah, guys, I don't know how we didn't know yeah. the whole time. Yeah, nice. that that kind of covers it for all the hauntings in Marquette, Michigan. The the town itself honestly looks really beautiful. It looks like a like a great escape spot for like a weekend if you're in the area. I'd love to go check it out. I don't know if I'll ever get to Marquette, Michigan, but if I do, you bet your ass I'll be checking out the lighthouse and trying to get into these apartment buildings to see if there's any any ghost. Just knock on all their doors. Like, I'll find yeah. an air. Airbnb. Yeah. And they, they probably do Airbnb out one of the one or two of those apartments. You probably could. Actually, I don't know if you can Airbnb, Airbnb out regular apartments. Maybe condos. Anyways, that's irrelevant. So uh, we did check off Orphanage. That's now on the list of episodes that we covered. I unexpectedly went into this and didn't realize how angry and sad it was going to make me to cover an orphanage. So. <laughs> yeah. I won't be covering any orphanages anytime soon. But I thought I, a bunch of dead kids was going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Yeah. Like a animal shelter next, geez. Yeah, really. <laughs> mm. We'll be sure to bring you on for that one too, Crystal. And yeah. anyone that's like really sad, we're like, all right, we need Crystal for this one because it's going to be really fucking sad, and she needs to react to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Is there anything yeah. else any of you wanted to cover in Marquette before we? I think that should be pretty much. That should pretty much do it, Crystal. Thanks for joining. Where can the people find you on social media? Ooh, good question. Um, 
you guys can find me at Crystal Quinn on Twitter and Instagram. I in my bio I have a link tree, so you can always check that out. I am also a co-host on Hack the Movies, which is a YouTube slash podcast kind of thing where we talk about like a lot of different movie reviews. I tend to love the horror episodes. We just did the new Hellraiser and the new Halloween Ends. Mm-hmm. So you can my opinions on those ones. And yeah, we do some fun things once in a while. I think I, I think I found you from the Hack the Movies Trick or Treat episode. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah, no. I think that's. You did that's not cool. get as many view, like as many views on that one as I wanted. All the good ones mm. never get as many views. We're like, come on, guys, Trick or Treat's phenomenal. <laughs> Trick or Treat's such that a good movie. Yeah, we did review that one. The we new all, Hellraiser. You know, the new Hellraiser was definitely better than the 2018 Hellraiser. I thought. I went through an entire marathon of watching all the Hellraisers. I don't know. Right. While, the, while this isn't a horror movie review, but we should definitely have you back for one since you are an mm, expert. True. Uh, can you give us a five second review of what you thought about the new Halloween movie? Without spoilers. Okay. Uh, what I thought was it could have been two different movies and I would have been okay with it. Okay. Boom. There you go. I think oh, wasn't yeah. that our like exact review? That's pretty much how we <laughs> how we covered it as well. Yep. It's completely common sense. I don't. I think there should have been. It should have been two totally different things. I think if you took more of the Corey aspect put it towards the end and keep Michael alive in that legacy kind of aspect, I mm-hmm. think it really could have kept the story going. But I think you need a lot more Lori and Michael. I think that's mm-hmm. what everyone wanted. You go through this entire series with these characters. You go through their lives. And that's what you get? Really? Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but it was I, I didn't hate it. It would have been a great movie if there was a different name on it. Mm-hmm. Like it would have well, great, maybe not, but it would have been a good movie if it, it if it was good. and then they were like, oh well, this is gonna be a cult classic like Halloween three, which I'm obsessed with. Yes, and, my favorite one. <sighs> Halloween three is the best. It is the but, best. The thing with that is it's completely different. You're sure people were looking to see Michael, but it was established that once mm-hmm. you start watching it, he's not really there at all. And it was they were no. trying to create something different. This can't yep. be a Halloween Ends can't be a cult classic because you still have Michael in the entire thing, but it's a different story. You made it about Corey. No, it's different because he he was in his Michael Myers hole. Yes. <laughs> Living on the ground. Yeah. Anyways. That's exactly right. what Michael would do. And then I'm like, how also did he get to certain houses? I, the, I, only, I, the only logical explanation was that he hopped on the bi- back of the motorcycle with Corey and, and just drove from, <laughs> drove around the location. They left those scenes up because there's no way to film that without it being silly, but that's the only explanation. The only Unless he was on the Mike, Michael Myers helicopter. Who knows? Oh, mm. God. So uh, many I have, but yes. Well, we'll save further ever. discussions for more horror movie reviews. But uh, thank you again, Crystal, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. You were fantastic. Really? And, thank uh, you. We will drop a link to Crystal's socials in the show notes and in the YouTube description as soon as we grab that little link tree information, but it will be there. So, yes, uh, my, Matt says that was the longest five-second review. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, I think that'll pretty much do it. Uh, Crystal, thank you so much, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. So that'll pretty much do it for us, ladies and gentlemen. If you guys uh, haven't already, make sure you swing over to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review and a comment, and we will read it out. And uh, that's how you do that. And if you want to also support the show, the best way to do that is on Patreon. So about Patreon as low as $3 a month. You can also uh, be involved in Patreon, get exclusive access, early access to ad free content and get your name in the credits. I believe we had one new patron and I yeah, want to I... quickly shelf that one out. I didn't see it on the list, but it looks like Kastner um, yeah. new $3 pledge. So thank you so much. Oh, Mallory Kastner. I didn't even see the word Mallory. So thank you, Mallory for, joining and welcome to the patreon family and we'll get your name in the credits as soon as that processes but thank you so much uh she left us a really nice email as well oh hell yeah she's uh nice she's got her husband listening her friends at work listening so good stuff hell yeah brand ambassador well thank you so much what are we covering next week next week we are next week we are heading to another state that we are not yet covered we are going to ogden utah several haunted locations it's not a real place to cover that doesn't sound real. Ogden? I hope, Ogden, Utah? I hope it's a real place. That's not I hope so. Place. Yeah, put all that work in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. cool. And then um, horror movie reviews. Uh, we're going to drop our review on Evil Dead 
the entire franchise. Well, sort of one, two, and three. The original right? trilogy. Yeah. Yep. That yep. will drop on Friday. Yep. Dude, I've been banging out the TV show. It's so good. It's so it much is. fun. Yeah. See, they're um, making another movie. Yeah. Hell yeah. Very cool. Exciting. Yes. All right. Well, anything else, gentlemen? That's going to do it for me. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Peace. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, turn on the notification bell so you know when we go live for brand new episodes, which we do every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to be in on the live chat, join in the fun and games, get your comments up on the screen, make sure to join the live broadcast of the show every single week, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We are live, so join us. I hope you liked it. Also, for as little as $3 a month, you can join us on Patreon and get your name officially in the credits. What more could you want? Well, for a few more dollars, you can get extra perks, some swag, additional side content, early access, all that kind of fun stuff. It's all available on Patreon. So swing by. Thank you guys again for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.